Before we embark upon a botanical analysis of India's famous soma plant, you might want to avail yourself beforehand to our introductory podcast on our current vague impressions on this mind-altering agent and the role it once played in helping establish four of the world's great religions, namely Hinduism, Buddhism, Jainism, and Zoroastrianism. And in our quest to shed light on the long-lost identity of the Soma plant, allow me to state right up front that I have always pursued this botanical subject under an assumption that many professional linguists, Sanskritists, might find objectionable. That assumption is as follows. I place my trust in the commentaries of post-Vedic scriptural sources of India, meaning those texts that date from 2,400 years ago to about 800 years ago, which make constant references to soma drinking rites in both priestly practices and mythic narratives. To deny the veracity or relevance of these classical and medieval scriptural sources is to impose one's own personal presumptions over concrete evidence that comes straight from historical records. There is simply no rational reason to, to doubt the contents of the Indian Upanishads, the epics, and the voluminous tomes of mythical tales of the Puranas, because all of these sources weigh heavily in favor on Soma's continued use as a sacred inebriant during classical and post-classical eras of Indian history. We can be certain that prehistoric ritual practices of Indo-Aryans persisted beyond the centuries that witnessed the birth of Jainism and Buddhism around 2,500 years ago. This is because early Buddhist records make frequent references to soma drinking and the celebrated lives of many famous soma drinkers. Furthermore, Buddhist communities have always recognize the Vedic pantheon, which is prehistoric as their very own. And according to traditional scriptures, that same pantheon would not be immortal, but for the nectar of the gods, Soma. These points of fact justify, I believe, my use of iconographic and symbolic imagery from India's past as legitimate points of historical reference to investigate matters relating to Soma's botanical identity. And in this connection, I also feel no hesitation in referring to archaeological records of Southeast Asia or to the remains of Aryan traditionalists that extended their unique brand of religious expression to lands that lie far beyond their place of origin in the Indian subcontinent. Conceivably, this place is the Soma sacrifice on the island of Sri Lanka, throughout the Mekong River Basin in Indochina, and then northward from Afghanistan to northern China and Japan, and southward to the Indonesian archipelago. All of these lands received Buddhist and Brahmanic seers and sages and historians 
over the course of more than two millennia. In our attempt to determine the botanical identity of Soma, I will employ standard practices in plant identification by first translating metaphorical allusions and symbolic references to the plant into diagnostic or what we refer to in the botanical business as key botanical characteristics. This will be accomplished by considering English translations of Vedic passages that are based collectively on scriptures from all four Vedas, including translations from the 19th century, such as those of Griffith, Keith, and Stevenson, as well as those from the 20th and 21st centuries, including those of Panikkar, Doniger, Gonda, Jameson, Brereton, among others. Most of my quoted materials of the Rick and Vedic Sama Vedas uh, in this presentation are extracted directly from the 19th century translations of Griffith and Stevenson. But a few of my quoted stanzas are composite translations from the aforementioned 20th century translators. Although some Sanskrit translations of the past are somewhat at variance with one another, the general context that can be garnered from metaphorical references to the Soma plant are actually not so arguable. This is because descriptions and word associations, as opposed to arguable semantic interpretations of Vedic verses, can serve the purpose of connecting metaphorical inferences and references to physical features of the soma plant. And from there, then, we can begin a botanical assessment. So where shall we begin? Let's first consider one of the more recent stabs at determining the identity of soma from an era, a past era, <laughs> not so long ago, in which interests in altered states of mind and Eastern religions were on the rise. In 1967, a retired vice president of Chase Manhattan Bank, an amateur student of mushroom use in human history by the name of Gordon Wasson, published a controversial book entitled Soma, Divine Mushroom of Immortality. This historical study caused quite a stir in academic circles because it was published by an individual that operated outside of environment, academic environments, and because it threw an unexpected curveball at scholarly tradition by suggesting the plant in question was actually a species of mushroom, a fungus. Wasson's book included a lengthy and thorough chapter on the history of modern attempts to identify the soma plant by a contributing Sanskrit specialist, Dr. Wendy Doniger from the University of Chicago. And she presented a rather lengthy chapter in the book that seemed to avoid, in a tacit way, direct support of Wasson's novel mushroom hypothesis, but added a lot of uh, useful details in describing the character of Soma. Mr. Wasson suggested that the ancient plant of the Indo-Aryans was the fly agaric mushroom, Ammonita muscaria, a bright red and white fungus of European and Russian folkloric renown. He argued that Vedic verses never make reference to the greenness of the soma plant, nor to its leaves, but only to the plant's upright stalks, which are typically described as being yellow, reddish, or, and or white in color, and resplendently so. Wasson also emphasized 
Soma's white robe-like covering and its preference for Himalayan, montane environments. So the banker envisaged these characteristics as apt descriptions of the fly agaric mushroom, which he and his Russian wife encountered frequently enough in their former mushroom collecting forays. Although Watson was not a specialist in South Asian studies, he had earned at this point in his life some credibility in the field of mycology, the biological study of fungi. He had published a popular article in Life magazine a decade earlier on the use of magic mushrooms among the Mastec Indians of northern Oaxaca, Mexico. Wasson employed his photographic and writing skills quite ably to update the modern world on the shamanic use of hallucinogens, a practice that 16th century Catholic priests had attempted quite successfully, I might add, to extinguish these pagan practices during the age of the Spanish conquest. While collecting species of these Mexican fungi for the first time for scientific identification, he made recordings of his interviews with a native Mazatec sorceress, Maria Sabina by name, and his rediscovery of the use of mind-altering mushrooms in the 20th century, as everyone knows, played a significant role in catalyzing the rise of psychedelic culture during the 1960s. And his authorship on the potential role of a fungus in the origin of Brahmanic traditions only added more fuel to public interests, growing public interests, on these subjects. Wasson was aware that a psychotropic agent known as muscomole was present in the fly agaric mushroom. And he hypothesized that this colorful fungus may well be the key to understanding the great secret of the Vedas. In the short run, a number of Sanskritists found his hypothesis compelling, if not conclusive, even if many students of Eastern religions and Sanskrit documents did not. It turns out, for instance, that the fly agaric mushroom unfortunately is not native to the Himalayas, nor to the valleys of northwest India, the birthplace of the Vedic hymns. Even though the conifer forests of this region of the world do harbor, as one might expect, a very rich fungal flora. Moreover, Soma is referred to recurrently in ancient Vedic songs as Vanaspati or Virupati, meaning literally Lord of Plants or Lord of Herbs, which pretty much negates a fungal determination. Vedic hymns also refer to the greening of mortar stones during the process of pressing the Soma plant's stems which can only be interpreted as the crushing of plant tissues that contain chlorophyll. That would not be a fungus. Frequent references are made to Soma's creeping growth habit in Vedic and post-Vedic records, and this characteristic would hardly complement the standard growth habit of a toadstool. So Wasson's courageous attempt at discovering the identity of the soma plant has pretty much faded from scholarly debates at this point in time. For the sake of brevity, I will not delve into the 20 or more plant species that have been proposed over the years as potential soma plant candidates. But I can state for the record that none of these proposals has convinced more than a few students on the subject, save perhaps for one favored plant group that is often given serious consideration. And that would be a group of plants known scientifically as ephedras, or in English as either the joint pine or Mormon's tea. In China, this plant group is known widely as ma wang. 
The ephedra plant group, comprising around 60 species globally, is distinguished by its multi-jointed leafless stems. These stems develop in tight clusters that form upright or clamoring shrubs in both cool and warm arid lands of the world. Ephedras are usually encountered in cool deserts or across uh, grasslands, the steppes of high plains. Even though a few species can and do thrive in dry tropical scrub, all of which habitat types can be found, in fact, within the historical domains of Central Asian Aryan tribes. However, the natural vegetation that dominates the landscapes of early Indo-Aryan peoples, at least those described in the Vedas, in, uh, is the Punjab, which is actually out of a land that is out of bounds for this plant group. It turns out Vedic bards compose their chants in a very cool and moderately wet region of India, and uh, this is not a region in which one would be apt to find ephedra plants. Har they did collect their soma stems in situ in that region. Joint pines produce small clusters of petalous cones once a year, these bearing small filamentous pollen-bearing structures that extend beyond the cone scales. The sap of joint pines is sparing and is clear when the stems are cut. The sap renders a well-known stimulating alkaloid known as ephedrine, which has a, a long history uh, in medicinal use, both in the Americas and in, in Asia. In fact, ephedrine is the plant product most commonly employed as a chemical precursor for the commercial synthesis of crystal meth, aka methamphetamines. So, stimulating this plant, to be sure. Yet, while pharmacological effects of such type might support its consideration as a soma plant candidate, the general aspect and geographical distribution of joint pines are entirely inconsistent with what we know about the soma plant, which had a bright and very showy aspect, by all Aryan accounts, and, as we shall soon see, had milky sap. These traits do not agree at all with the botanical uh, features of Phaedra. Since the original composers of the Vedic hymns harvested their soma stems in temperate mountains and plains of the Punjab, that would be in northwest India, areas such as the Kashmir, we can limit our search for the soma plant among floristic elements that inhabit this precisely defined home range of the Indo-Aryan tribes.